Good morning. It's partly cloudy. It's sunny. It's about 35 degrees on the stage. I don't know what it is in the sun. But we all know that it never rains in Autzen Stadium. I thought you should hear that one last time. My name is Jason Yonker. I am the Assistant Vice President and Advisor to the President on Sovereignty and Government-to-Government -Government Relations at the University of Oregon. I'm also the Chief of the Coquel Indian Tribe, but most importantly, I graduated from here. The University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional indigenous homelands of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the Western Coast Reservation. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon, and they continue to make important contributions in their communities at the University of Oregon and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. We express our respect for all federally recognized tribal nations in Oregon. This includes the Burns Paiute Tribe, the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquel Nation, the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians, and the Klamath Tribes. Not only do we acknowledge that this is their land, but we are the only university in the world that has all nine federally recognized flags of Oregon flying in the center of our campus. That is something we should be proud of. We also express our respect for all other displaced indigenous peoples who now call Oregon home. Thank you. Good morning, Ducks. Welcome to the University of Oregon's 2023 commencement ceremony. I am Chris Winter, the Interim Vice President for the Division of Student Life. As both the U of O alum and current administrator, I am proud and honored to have this opportunity to share this special day with all of you. For those who are able, please stand for the presentation of colors. Thank you for rising as we will hear the singing of our national anthem performed today by the University of Oregon Gospel Singers, directed by Andy L. Brown.
the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly Thank you, Andiel, and members of the UO Gospel Singers. That was fantastic. And thank you, Jason, for today's land acknowledgement. I would like to recognize the two university marshals who led our students onto the field this morning. Faith Barter, who carried the U of O Mace, is an assistant professor of English and this year's recipient of the A.J. Ersted Faculty Achievement Award for Distinguished Teaching, one of the university's highest honors for excellence in the classroom. Thank you, Faith, for the positive impact you have made on our U of O students. And Arissa Mehta, who carried the U of O Gonfalon, the outgoing ASUO Senate President and a U of O graduate this year in political science and general social, social science. Please join me in recognizing these two outstanding individuals. Now to deliver greetings and a message from the Board of Trustees of the University of Oregon, Oregon uh, our board chair, <laughs> Ginevra Ralph. Ginevra. Thank you, Chris, and welcome everyone to this proud and celebratory day. We call it commencement, but really it's the now what are you gonna do day. And some of you are even having the, what are you gonna do with that degree day? <laughs> I will assert that you can do anything you want with that degree that you've earned so hard. You've learned, you'll get, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of applause for you. It, you are, we are so proud of you. You've learned how to analyze, to compute, to draft, to compose, to write, research, and communicate. Most importantly, you've learned to recognize what you still don't know and how to get those answers. So today is the first day of what you are going to do with that degree. Go do great things, make our world a better place, and come back and tell us all about it. Now for my official responsibility, it is with deep pride and sincere congratulations that 
on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the University of Oregon and by the power invested in us by the State of Oregon, I authorize President Jamie Moffitt to confer upon you your hard-earned degrees. Congratulations to the class of 2023. Welcome to the alumni family and go Ducks! Thank you, Ginevra, not just for your time this morning, but for your dedication and service to the University of Oregon, your connection and contributions to the university as a former student, former faculty member, and member of the OVO Foundation Board, and most recently as the chair of our Board of Trustees, has been remarkable. An original trustee, Ginevra is stepping down at the end of June after nine years on our Board of Trustees we are indebted to you for your service to the university. Please help me in thanking our board chair, Geneva Roth. And now I'd like to introduce the University of Oregon interim president, Jamie Moffitt, with this year's president's remarks. President Moffitt has been leading the university since March. Upon the arrival of our incoming President Carl Schultz on July 1st, Jamie will return to her position as Senior Vice President of Finance and Administration and Chief Financial Officer. She joined the university in 2003, serving in numerous leadership roles. She earned her bachelor's and Juris Doctor from Harvard and her master's from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Not too bad. We are extremely fortunate and very grateful for her leadership. Jamie. Welcome everyone, and congratulations to the class of 2023. This is your day. As was said, I'm Jamie Moffitt, Interim President of the University of Oregon. It is amazing to me to see you all here. 32 years ago, I was in your shoes graduating from college. That was a long time ago, I admit. And I have to admit, I don't remember a lot from my graduation ceremony. I have a good excuse though. One of my college roommates was actually the student speaker, and I was so incredibly nervous for her that I don't think I heard much else of what was said during that ceremony. If you had told me on that day that I would be speaking at a graduation ceremony like this in front of thousands of people, I would have thought you were absolutely nuts. So you never know where life can lead you, and it can lead you to some wonderful places. Looking back on my experience, I wanted to share a few thoughts and reflections from my journey. One of the things that surprised me most after my college graduation was how much my life and the lives of my friends changed. And I'm not talking about the change of entering the working world full time. That was a bit of a shock. But rather, how suddenly our lives became so different in, from what we did. In college, we did not all do the same things. We studied different subjects, and we spent our time outside of classes differently. Some of my friends worked, some volunteered, some joined clubs and other campus organizations. I was a varsity athlete and spent a lot of time on the tennis court. But despite these choices, our days were really more like than different. Our lives had a similar cadence of spending time in classes, studying for exams, hanging out in the dining halls, and enjoying time together on campus. Once we graduated, however, our lives diverged in very dramatic ways. One of my roommates joined the Peace Corps, and she spent her first few years out of college teaching English to middle school kids in Thailand. Another roommate went to medical school in New York, and she spent hours and hours doing rounds in an inner city hospital. Another one spent a career, started, excuse me, her career in marketing with Procter & Gamble, and she spent her days interviewing customers. I even had a roommate who joined the CIA. I have no idea what she was doing. <laughs> I went back to graduate school, and I spent hours and hours studying law cases. It was very interesting to me to realize how the choices we made had such a big impact on, our, how, we, on how we spent our lives not only in how we answered the question that you're gonna get a lot when you first meet people of what do you do, but in how we actually spent our time. I share this with you, not to scare you about large decisions you face, 
but rather to encourage you to consider how do you want to spend your days? Coming from a family that expected me to go to college, it felt like I had been on a set path all of my life until I graduated. And then the opportunities were wide open. So my first piece of advice to you all, and I am going to have three pieces of advice today, is to think hard about what you actually want to be doing with the hours that you'll be working. Do you enjoy working with other people in a team environment? Or would you prefer more solo work, such as coding or independent research and writing? Do you want a lot of structure to your job? Or would you prefer more flexibility to decide how to achieve your goals? Do you want to work in an office environment or out in the field? You're going to have these choices, and it's good to pay attention early on to what makes you happy. The reality is, regardless of what you do, you're going to spend a lot of hours at work. And so it's good to pick something that you're passionate about, both the focus of your work and how you're actually spending your time. Sometimes it can take a little while to figure out what you like doing. When I was in graduate school, I got an amazing internship working with Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund in Washington, DC. At the time, I thought that what I wanted to have was a career in environmental law. So this was the perfect summer job. While I loved the organization, the cause, and the people, I ended up spending most of that summer by myself in the law library, studying cases, and reading and writing legal memos. And over the course of that summer, I realized that I'm happiest when I'm more actively working with other people on teams with more constant engagement. It took that experience, however, for me to figure this out. And it took a further internship with a consulting firm for me to realize how much I love working with numbers and spreadsheets, believe it or not. <laughs> so my second piece of advice is that it's OK to experiment with different jobs and opportunities and to switch if you find that what you're doing is just not making you happy. It can take time to figure out how you want to focus your life. Personally, I've experimented with many different careers, professional tennis player, environmental lawyer, business consultant, professor, technology entrepreneur, chief financial officer, and for the last few months, interim university president. 50 years ago, college graduates probably expected to just step into one profession, maybe even one organization, for their entire career. Fortunately, today, there's no such expectation. And I say fortunately because I think this flexibility is a wonderful thing. It gives you the chance to try many different things you don't have to pick the perfect career on day one. If you do know exactly what you want to do when you graduate, that is terrific. But if you don't, that's fine as well. You'll get there. So my third and final piece of advice that I'd like to share with you comes from a discussion that I had with some of the student interns in my office last month. We had been talking about life and careers and professional development. They suggested that I talk with you about my experience with imposter syndrome. For those of you that may not have heard of this issue, imposter syndrome is that feeling when you step into a new role that you're not truly qualified to do it, and if people really knew your actual skill level and experience level, they never would have hired you into that position in the first place. It can be a very scary feeling. The students asked me if I had ever felt imposter syndrome. I think they were slightly shocked when I shared that I had suffered from imposter syndrome for good chunks of the first two decades of my career. I think that imposter syndrome affects far more people than anyone realizes. If you're one of those people who can just step into a new role with great confidence, that is fantastic. However, if you're like me, where you might find yourself questioning your skills and credentials, please know that you are not alone. Many of us have questions and doubts when we're asked to take on new roles. If you end up experiencing imposter syndrome, take a deep breath. It's OK. It's normal. And it's perfectly normal in today's environment where people change jobs and careers so often. I've personally found you can be very successful in new roles as long as you're willing to put in the time, effort, and work to get up to speed. 32 years ago, I was nervously listening to my college roommate's graduation speech. Four months ago, I was happily reviewing spreadsheets with finance staff in my permanent CFO role without a thought about serving as interim president or presiding over commencement. If at either time you would have told me that I'd be speaking at this event, I would have been shocked and, quite honestly, incredibly stressed. 
Some of you might have felt imposter syndrome when you started at the U of O, and yet here you are today. I've got this, and so do you. Congratulations, class of 2023, and go Ducks. Thank you, Jamie, for those inspiring words and for your service to the University of Oregon. I am now pleased to introduce the outgoing Senate President of the Associated Students of the University of Oregon, Arissa Mehta, with a message on behalf of the students at the University of Oregon. Arissa has served as a student senator since 2020 and was our ASUO Senate President this year. And personally, I can attest she has one of the best senses of humor that I've ever encountered. Arissa. Do I stand on this? Oh, sorry. OK. <laughs> Hello. Good morning, everyone. In the past year, I can definitely count on only one hand how many times I woke up before 9 AM. So I am pleasantly surprised that I made it on time this morning. And I'm sure many of you can relate. So cheers to us for even being here. Today is a day filled with a whirlwind of emotions, excitement, pride, and perhaps even a touch of bittersweetness. We gather here not only to celebrate the University of Oregon's graduating class of 2023, but also something much bigger, my 22nd birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but on a more serious note, I want to express gratitude to all the families, friends, faculty, and supporters who have joined us today to celebrate this special milestone because we all know we didn't achieve this alone. So I'm thanking them. Okay. <laughs> the past few weeks have been a time of reflection, not only on the memories from my college years, but on the experiences that have shaped my story, helping me become the person I am today. I'm sure many of you can recall setting foot on campus for the first time, attending that one class you never returned to, or the internal debate of whether or not you want to reveal that you're a Californian by bringing out an umbrella when it's raining. <laughs> Guilty. As we stand at the edge of a new chapter in our lives, let us take a moment to reflect on the memories we've created that have led us to this point. Moments of community, campus culture, and the weaving of our own unique stories. In this moment of self-reflection, I have confidence that each one of you, the class of 2023, carries shared experiences that have defined your identities. And I encourage you to reflect on those experiences as I share my own. Growing up in Southern California, I learned two valuable lessons. Always use an umbrella, even when it's sprinkling. And food has the unique ability to spark community. Being raised in a diverse neighborhood, lunchtime at school held a special significance for me. Some kids brought the usual pizza Lunchables, or PB&Js, where others brought bean and cheese burritos, kimchi and rice, or whatever their parents found on sale at Costco. When I opened my lunchbox in the cafeteria, the delicious smell of dumplings filled the air, and I would look forward to lunch. However, lunchtime quickly became the most nerve-wracking part of my day, when my pride turned into embarrassment as people asked, what was that stinky with? I often ended up skipping lunch or waiting until I got back home to eat because I feared being teased for the smell of my food my mom would pack me. I didn't want to have to convince people that it actually tasted good. It wasn't until fifth grade that I found other friends who also had stinky lunches. We bonded over our ethnic foods and came up with a strategy to open our lunch boxes simultaneously so the cafeteria would only experience one quick stinky whiff. It was like a mini Asian market, remembering how we traded and shared our foods from our different, different cultures. But this was the first memory of finding a community and embracing my Asian American identity. Here at the University of Oregon, I've been able to build upon that sense of community and grow into a proud, half Vietnamese, half Indian young woman. I stand before you, <laughs> thank you. I stand before you, grateful for the communities I found on campus and have been able to share my story with. I've balanced going to culture club meetings such as the Vietnamese Student Association or the Asian and Pacific American Student Union 
while also holding leadership roles in ASUO, working with the Alumni Association, and even going up to the state prisons in Salem on Tuesday nights for prison education program classes. <laughs> These are just a few of the very communities that I've been able to weave into my story and have allowed me to shine as an individual. I will also cherish moments such as being able to host some of my friends for Vietnamese New Year and cooking a full dinner while also sharing a piece of my identity and showing them a different culture. Our campus has become a true community, knitted together by shared experiences, and I hope each of you truly reflect on the groups you've encountered during your time here, whether through fraternity and sorority life, playing in the Oregon marching band, connecting with fellow non-traditional students, or simply sitting amongst your peers in class or right now in this very moment. I urge you to continue building your identity wherever you go, because I am now empowered to tell my story with true authenticity, to step into roles unapologetically myself, and to embrace these experiences that have shared my identity. The essence of our college experience lies within the stories we've written and will continue to write. While the COVID-19 pandemic was a long and arduous chapter in our stories, we've arrived here today celebrating together face to face. We as individuals have come together to create an unforgettable community of ducks, each playing a role in this beautiful story. Each of us have faced personal trial, trials and tasted sweet triumphs, those late night study sessions where exhaustion threatened to consume us, and the demanding exams that pushed us to our limits, and also the occasional heartbreak that tested our resilience. Building our own stories means embracing the unknown, taking risks, and defying the expectations society may place on us. So, my fellow graduates, when confronted with that dreaded question of what are you doing next, remember this, your story belongs to you and you alone. It unfolds in the direction you choose and at the pace you set. Some of us may not know what lies ahead in a year or even what we're gonna have for lunch after this ceremony, but that's okay. Even if you don't have the next chapter planned out, you've had years of preparation to ensure that it's written in a way that truly reflects who you are. As I look back on our time at UL, I will always cherish the memories of basking in the sunshine on the EMU green when the temperature soared to a whopping 70 degrees. I will recall flooding the streets of Eugene during football games and rem reminiscing about the connections we've made with the very people sitting beside us today. Whether you've built your own tight-knit community during your time here or not, rest assured that you're leaving with a large duck family that will support you for the rest of your lives. As you embark on the next chapter, I urge you to continue building your stories, as am I, wherever they may take you. Expand your flock beyond the streets of Eugene, treasure nostalgic moments, and always remember to embrace yourself, your identity, and your experiences. It's been an honor to share my story as one of the five women speaking here today, but I do want to give a special shout out to my family, my mom and dad, who put my face on a stick, for always encouraging me to remain authentically myself even if that means carrying a stinky but delicious lunch and always supporting me as I write my own story. Thank you and congratulations, my fellow class of 2023. And as always, go Ducks. <laughs> oh, and before I go, here's a short video with a few images of our journey.
have that full circle from the very start of our first day of freshman orientation when we all went onto the field. And it was a really good vibe. Everyone was just laughing, having fun, and really stoked to be here on the campus. First went into the dorms, uh, Barnhart. I met really cool people. Even if it's just like building a friendship with someone, we're all sort of in this together. I'm actually more nervous now, because I'm like, wow, I'm really an adult. Yeah, I'm freaking out just as much as you are. It feels exciting. I'm a little nervous for what the future holds, but if you're not nervous, you're not growing. It was just a thrilling experience to go through college with a lot of good people. Like, I feel very at home here. It can create many exciting memory with the people I love. Just the people, man, just the people. I feel like I'm doing the splits up here because everybody else has been short. <laughs> and I actually feel very privileged to be the only male speaker today. I'm having imposter syndrome. I am pleased to introduce our 2023 commencement speaker, Amy Bowers Cordalis. She is a fisherwoman an attorney, a mother, a member of the Yurok tribe from Northern California, which is not very far away from the Coquel on the Oregon coast, so we might be related. She is general counsel, was general counsel for the Yurok tribe and staff attorney at the Native American Rights Fund. All of that is extremely impressive, but perhaps one of my favorite things about Amy is the fact that she too is a duck. She earned her undergraduate degree in environmental studies in 2003 and has leveraged the knowledge she learned here to move mountains or better put, move dams. But I will let her tell you that story. Amy's work has been the foundation of her tribe's sovereignty and the enjoyment of its federally reserved water and fishing rights. Class of 2023, you are about to hear an extraordinary story and perspective that you can take with you wherever you go. I am honored to introduce to you your fellow alumna and this year's commencement speaker, Amy Bowers Cordalis. I agree. Neck now, Amy Bowers, Cordalis, Nuwak Rekwa, Numate Wa. Um, what's up, ducks? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it is an honor to be with you here today and wonderful to be back at the University of Oregon. Thank you to the university and the interim president Moffitt for the invitation. I remember being here not so long ago as a cheerleader doing backflips down the stadium. <laughs> and um, you know, I was thinking about being here and what it's like and all the energy that I feel and even since leaving here, um, and graduating and, and watching, you know, the Ducks play in this great stadium. And I remembered this one game, we were playing Stanford, and we just happened to be winning, right? And I jumped up and started doing a cheer and promptly sprained my ankle. <laughs> 
And one of the things that struck me about that is um, through time, you can go from doing backflips on the, you know, the turf of Autzen Stadium to doing a cheer in your front uh, living room. And that some things change, your abilities change, but the tenacious spirit of being a duck never fades. And I feel that today, and I feel that here, and I hope that you will carry that wherever you go from this day forward. So I am a member of the Yurok tribe, California's largest Indian tribe. And um, as um, James mentioned, I, um, my family is from the village of Requa at the mouth of the Klamath River. Who's been there? Anybody been there? No? OK, well, come visit us. We'd love to see you. My family has lived and fished there since time immemorial. And my dad always says that we have been fishing the same runs of salmon for so long that we now share the DNA with the fish. <laughs> he is here today, and I want to say hi, Dad. Hi, Mom. Hi, boys. Love you guys. <laughs> Under the direction of some very powerful Yurok tribal leaders, I have had the honor of leading the tribe's legal efforts to restore the Klamath River in what is now the largest river restoration and dam removal project in the history of the world. <laughs> work with the tribe, um, I realized that folks still don't know much about indigenous peoples. So before you graduate, one last comment. Columbus did not discover America, right? Right? Indigenous nations were here exercising sovereignty according to complex laws and policies all throughout what is now known as the United States. And importantly, we are still here. There are over 574 federally recognized Indian tribes and 63 state indigenous nations in this country. Many of these nations enjoy treaties with the United States that remain the supreme law of the land. These nations have sovereignty, just like the federal and state governments. Further, we can no longer be silent about the fact that indigenous women go missing and murdered at higher rates than any group. This must stop. And lastly, indigenous peoples don't want to be your mascot or your Halloween costume. Thank you. So at this point, you may be wondering if your commencement speaker is here to teach you one final class on Indigenous Peoples 101 or Salmon and River Restoration 101. Well, don't tempt me. We could be here for a while. <laughs> um, but we are here to talk about you and your remarkable achievement of graduating from the University of Oregon. Are the clouds coming out? Do you, so, so do you all feel more comfortable? Yeah, exactly. Earlier, I saw the, the students in the front rows. They had their um, towels blocking their eyes from the sun. <laughs> well, you can go out in true Eugene fashion with a little cloud cover, so we can all just get cozy, feel good. So here's what I want to share with you all today, that as you leave this university, it's important that you find your own purpose. And regardless of where you serve, where you stand, or what you choose to do, that you, you embrace that purpose. At Yurok, we have a saying, seeing from the mountain. Seeing from the mountain is about expanding our individual perspective that is usually rooted in our day-to-day -day struggles to see the bigger picture and to gain new insights to help us see our life's purpose and solve our most pressing problems. It is that type of perspective that unlocks the impossible. Phil Knight and Bill Bowerman, your fellow alumni, solved a problem using a waffle iron to make a pair of racing shoes. Sound ridiculous? Or like a game-changing idea that led to the founding of Nike. These ducks saw from the mountain, and it led them away from conformity, away from the expected. They sat high and dreamt big of something new. They chose, as you will choose, your own purpose. And while this university sits in a valley where it rains so much, the indigenous peoples used to call it the valley of death, 
It offers a wide variety of experiences that help you prepare your journey up the mountain. In the years I spent here, I went through the full arc of the University of Oregon experience. I went from being a business major and cheerleader, driving a red convertible, to studying ecofeminism, growing out my leg hair, and majoring in political science and environmental studies. <laughs> My, my friends and I, who spent so much time together, we called ourselves the amoeba, were commonly referred to as dirt munch and tree huggers from Eugene. <laughs> the amoeba is here today. Love you, ladies. <laughs> we had some fantastic experiences, like spending the night in a VW van in the Autzen Stadium parking lot to get in line early for duck football tickets and only to wake up late, and the line for tickets was wrapped several times around the stadium. We hosted Tibetan monks who were performing at the University Folk Festival, and one morning in the front lawn of the Amoeba House on Harris Street, the monks and the Amoeba hula hoop to Madonna's Like a Prayer. <laughs> Indeed, the U of O molded me, the Amoeba, and my car, that same rent convertible, which was no match for the rain here, leaked terribly. Water pooled on the floor, and by spring, the back seat had sprouted grass and mold. It's gross. Yes, the U of O mold me in the truest sense. <laughs> Ironically, later that year, that red convertible died on I-5 because the engine ran out of water. <laughs> But I also experienced one of the most traumatic and transformative events of my life. In 2002, I was a major or junior, um, and over the summer, I had an internship with the Yurok Tribal Fisheries Department. And the largest fish kill on American waters occurred on the Klamath River. Excessive water diversions for agriculture had left river flows the lowest in history, which coupled by poor river conditions created by the dams, made the river so sick and so polluted, a fish disease spread. More than 70,000 adult Chinook salmon died within just a few days, entirely within the Yurok Reservation. By the end of the fish kill, the river looked and smelled like a war zone. I remember looking out from the fisheries boat surrounded by thousands of dead bobbing carcasses. Their rotting bodies began to line the banks of the river three to four layers deep, filling the air with an unimaginable stench of death. I wasn't in a boat on a river. I was in a graveyard for a vital component of my culture, our history, and our future. I knew right there that for my family, my tribe, and everyone who would follow, I would spend my life working to prevent this type of ecocide from ever happening again. And I would dedicate every ounce of my being toward healing the Klamath River to restoring balance between humans and nature. While I would never wish those fish to die, their death helped me see my own purpose. To grasp what I felt, you got to understand my culture, my family, and my history. My family has signed treaties with the United States government, won a Supreme Court case, battled the federal and state governments in the salmon wars to preserve Yurok fishing rights and salmon because they are inextricably tied to our own survival. Salmon for my tribe doesn't exist as fillets on our dinner plates or smoked accents to our bagel trays. These fish swim beneath the surface of our consciousness. Their lives, their history, and their future is entwined with ours. After the fish kill, I returned to the university and finished my degree and went straight to law school. Since then, I've had the great honor and privilege of serving my tribe and the river. So it's, it's hard not to obsess on your graduation day about the jobs you will be doing in a month, in a year, or in a decade from now but I challenge you to obsess about something else entirely. Think about when you'll know you've made it. How will it feel? 
When will you know you're succeeding? When will you know you are fulfilling your purpose? For me, one of those moments came last November. I sat in a hearing room in Washington, D.C. in the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission hearing meeting, or room, excuse me. It was time for them to vote on climate dam removal. I brought my husband and my son to share the moment. The people from the river couldn't make it, so it was just us and four or five Pacific Corps employees that represented the company that owned the dams. As my family and I took seats next to them, I remembered fighting them, threatening them, and then finally, towards the end, working with them. They smiled at me, shook my hand, and we sat down. And you could feel the excitement in the hearing room. And then the meeting began. The commission called it to order. There were brief introductory remarks, and then a motion to approve the consent agenda, which was approved. And that was it. A gentleman's voice next to me whispered, it's done. They approved Klamath Dam removal. Yeah, thank you. While I knew that uh, dam removal was on the consent agenda, I thought that there would be verbal fireworks, you know, some kinds of explosions, speeches, you know, clapping, something that, you know, marked the historical precedent setting, you know, motion that this was. But it was, it was still, it was quiet. In the midst of that mundane process and procedure of just a regular normal meeting, that's when I knew it. Not only had we won, but that I was living my purpose. These are the moments that I hope you will pursue. Not titles or salaries or acclaim, but solutions, sustainability, progress, community. Decades ago, Yurok tribal leadership started advocating for dam removal. And for years, the idea of dam removal was unheard of. People didn't think it was possible, but Yurok leadership knew it was key to river restoration and salmon restoration, and not only our survival as Yurok people, but to all the people of the Klamath Basin. So they kept fighting. After 20 years of advocacy, the Klamath dams are finally coming down. <laughs> Iron Gate Dam, the lowest dam along the river and the three behind it, built with iron and steel and once believed to be impossible to breach, will be removed and the river will run free once again by December 2024. <laughs> dam removal ultimately worked because the interest of business, indigenous nations and environment aligned and were given equal value. It now stands as a model to how to renew the world, how humans can actually be good stewards of our planet by working together, respecting one another and the rights of nature, rather than continuing to harm our planet through extractive economies. Sitting in your seat, not so long ago, um, I had no idea my journey would allow me to contribute to this historical dam removal project. And I share my story today because there is hope. And even if from where you sit today, it may appear that you are inheriting a troubled world, a troubled world with problems that seem impossible to solve, there is hope. You likely never imagined that part of your college experience would be online with virtual classes during a global pandemic, or that you'd find yourself in the middle of a climate crisis, and that during your time at the U of O, Oregon would suffer from the effects of drought and wildfires. Making matters worse, perhaps you never envisioned that in our country, food insecurity would be widespread, abortion would be made illegal, school shootings would occur regularly, or that a former president would be indicted. Yet, if we can see beyond the hardships that these events create in our everyday lives, we can see that these same challenges force change on a larger scale. They break down power structures that no longer serve the public interest to allow new light 
new ways of doing business, and new ways of living. When we work together, we can solve problems. This is what I have learned from my journey from this very stadium, this very valley, up to the Klamath mountaintops. Looking out from the Klamath mountaintops, I see that the Fishkill helped me find my life purpose and that this university provided me a safe space and resources to exercise self-determination to develop the skills and grit I needed to pursue my life's purpose. I see now that while there are many challenges we face, we cannot let history keep us from the world we want to see. May we all see seeing from the mountain, appreciate that we are on the verge of historical change towards a more sustainable way of life on planet Earth. The climate crisis is forcing us towards sustainability and healthier relationships between humans and nature. I see indigenous knowledge and leadership leading the way. That indeed, we can remove Iron Gate dams and let rivers run free by waking up every day and devoting our life force to peace, community, and sustainability. <laughs> Looking out from the Klamath mountaintops, I see that the pandemic forced us to adapt. While we were apart physically and developed new technologies that helped us connect with one another and learn in new ways. It forced us outside and reawakened us to the pull of nature and powerful outdoor spaces. Looking out from the mountaintop, I see that relationships matter. Our connection to people and place makes a difference in our lives. Meaningful relationships cannot be made on Twitter, Instagram, or getting lost in your phones. Show up and love your people. This will make you happier. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. There. <laughs> Looking out from the mountaintops, I hope that you see your degree is not just a piece of paper. It represents years of your hard work, determination, and dedication. You already adapted to new ways of living. And despite a global pandemic and climate crisis and all the other challenges that you faced, you have persevered and succeeded. You have earned a college degree. Through your time here, you have developed the skills and grits to pursue your life's purpose. Congratulations to all of you. So it's time for you all to start your own journey from this stadium, from the valley, and start looking at what mountain you will climb. You will be presented with many paths and you don't have to know which one is right at this moment. You can, however, decide boldly and from this valley that no matter which mountain you choose, you will be a part of new solutions and not old systems. That you will seed peace and not conflict. That you will advance sustainability and not apathy. That you will work with BIPOC and LGBTQ communities to build relationship and community, not division and hate. <laughs> and that you will do this from whatever peaks or valleys you stand upon for the years to come. University of Oregon class of 2023, you are the answer to your ancestors' prayers and ours. You are now a part of the community of a hundred of thousands of ducks who will support you and cheer you on. And you can always come back to this valley as I have today. You have been molded by this university, but hopefully you will fare far better than my red convertible. <laughs> I believe in you, your friends and families and support systems believe in you, and this university community believes in you too. And as you move into the world, we send you off with our blessings and prayers that you will choose to summit mountaintops that grant you soaring perspectives, perspectives that will reveal your passion and ignite your purpose. 
Congratulations, class of 2023. Go Ducks. Now this is more like it, right at my height and everything. Is anybody cold? Yeah, well, you're not gonna like this part. If you're an American Indian or Alaska Native, you always have to give gifts to your speakers, those who have given you a gift. And we would like to present to you Amy Bowers Cordalis, a traditional necklace made of dentalium pine nuts and appropriately colored beads. If you don't know already, the more dentalium that you show, it's bling in native country. She's a wealthy person. Also, this is the University of Oregon's custom blanket produced by eighth generation. This is the last one on campus. But don't worry, there's more coming this fall to a duck store near you. <laughs> and perhaps somebody up there might buy you one. But it features traditional basketry patterns that represent ducks working together to fly home. Go Ducks! And now, class of 2023, the moment you have been waiting years for, we will now begin the official process of conferring degrees. Candidates for graduate degrees will present, be presented by Vice Provost of Graduate Studies, Krista Cronister. Will all candidates for doctoral degrees please rise and remain standing? President Moffitt, the qualified students for doctoral degrees are now presented to receive the appropriate degrees. All right. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and with the authority of the Board of Trustees of the University of Oregon, I am pleased to confer upon you, members of this June 2023 graduating class, your respective doctoral degrees, which you have earned at the University of Oregon. Congratulations. You may now take your seats. Will all the candidates for master's degrees please rise and remain standing. <laughs> President Moffitt, the qualified students for master's degrees are now presented to receive the appropriate degrees. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and with the authority of the Board of Trustees of the University of Oregon, I am pleased to confer upon you, members of this June 2023 graduating class, 
your respective master degrees, which you have earned at the University of Oregon. Congratulations. You can be seated. I'm now going to ask our interim provost, Janet Woodruff Borden, to call each of the academic deans forward in turn to present bachelor's degree candidates from each academic division. Thank you, President Moffitt. As the interim provost and executive vice president, it's my great honor to introduce our deans to recognize the hard work and dedication of our bachelor's degrees recipients. We begin with Carol Stabile, Acting Dean of the Clark Honors College. Will those graduates who are students of the Robert D. Clark's Honors College, one of the top public honors colleges in the country, please rise and remain standing. It has been my great honor to watch you persevere, argue with one another and our faculty, grow as thinkers and human beings and research and write brilliant and beautiful theses. You've learned how to interpret the world and now you will lead efforts to change it. Congratulations. Sabrina Madison Cannon, Phyllis and Andrew Borwick Dean of the School of Music and Dance. Well, the candidates for the bachelor's degrees in the School of Music and Dance, one of the preeminent com comprehensive music and dance programs in the Northwest, please rise and remain standing until the degrees have been conferred. <laughs> President Moffitt and Provost Woodruff Borden, it is my sincere honor to present the qualified students before you to receive the appropriate degrees. May they continue to enrich the world with their empathy, creative energy, and innovation. And may they continue to add to our knowledge of the arts of music and dance through their scholarship. Laura Lee McIntyre, Dean of the College of Education. Will the candidates for bachelor's degrees in the College of Education please rise and remain standing until the degrees have been conferred. Let's go, docs. On behalf of our over 180 preeminent research, instructional, and clinical faculty, I congratulate you, COE Docs. President Moffitt and Provost Woodruff Borden, the qualified students before you are now presented to receive the appropriate degrees. Juan Carlos Mayeda, Edwin L. Arts Dean of the School of Journalism and Communication. Buenos dias, mi gente. Will the candidates for the bachelor's degrees in the School of Journalism and Communication please rise and remain standing until the degrees have been conferred? This year, I watched you accomplish impactful in storytelling and reporting, research, campaigns, creative projects, and more, all while continuing to navigate the uncertainty of this evolving world. Graduates, I am in awe of your resilience, your skills, your creativity, and your perseverance. You have let nothing to stop you 
from reaching the finishing line, and I'm so, so proud of you. Interim President Moffitt and Interim Provost Woodruff Warden, it is my privilege to present the qualified students before you to receive their degrees. Adrian Parr, Dean of the College of Design. Will the candidates for the bachelor degrees in the College of Design please rise? And please remain standing until the degrees have been conferred. I couldn't be more proud of you on this day. I wish you all the best. Go out there into the world, put to work everything that you've learned here, the experiences that you've gained, and please don't forget, you're always a duck. Interim President Moffat and Interim Provost Woodruff Borden, the qualified students before you are now presented to receive the appropriate degrees. Congratulations and go ducks. Bruce Blonigan, Dean of the Lundquist College of Business. Good morning. Will the candidates for a bachelor's degree from the Charles H. Lundquist College of Business please rise and remain standing until the degrees have been conferred? As graduates of one of the top-ranked public business schools in the United States, the students before you will be the business leaders of tomorrow. On behalf of our faculty and staff in the Lundquist College of Business, we are incredibly proud of you. Go Ducks! <laughs> President Moffitt and Provost Woodruff Borden, the qualified students before you are now presented to receive the appropriate business degrees. Chris Paulson, Tykeson Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Good morning, Ducks. Will the candidates for the bachelor's degree in the College of Arts and Sciences, one of the nation's premier public liberal arts colleges, please rise and remain standing until the degrees have been confirmed. On behalf of the college's esteemed faculty and dedicated staff, I congratulate you on your remarkable achievements. May you continue your path of learning and discovery and use your exceptional talents and knowledge to create positive change that leads to a more just, more sustainable, more compassionate world. President Moffat and Provost Woodruff Borden, the qualified students before you are now presented to receive the appropriate degrees. Go Ducks. President Moffitt, upon the recommendation of the deans from the University of Oregon's undergraduate schools and colleges, I present to you for conferral of baccalaureate degrees, the University of Oregon class of 2023. Congratulations. <laughs> Upon the recommendation of the faculty and with the authority of the Board of Trustees of the University of Oregon, I'm pleased to confer upon you, members of this June 2023 graduating class, the respective baccalaureate degrees which you have earned at the University of Oregon. Congratulations. You may now move your tassels from the right to the left. Thanks.
Congratulations, Ducks. In a moment, we, we, we will begin our celebratory traditions and graduate exit, but before we do, I have a few important instructions for graduates and guests. All graduates will need to exit the field the way you came in. For CAS natural science graduates, you will be directed to the staging area for your ceremony as you emerge from the tunnel. You will get to meet up with your families after your college ceremony. For all other graduates, please head out the way you came in and exit through the Mo Gate. You can meet your friends and family on the south side of the stadium. To grads and guests, if you're heading back to campus for a school and college ceremony, we ask that you please leave your cars parked here at the stadium and utilize the shuttles that are waiting outside the south gate to take you to campus. I also ask that those with 1 p.m. school and college ceremonies be given priority access to shuttles if possible. If you have questions throughout the day, please feel free to text our helpful team at the number on the screen until 5 p.m. today. Before we shout, I know, before we shout, I have one last favor for the graduates. Please join me in a salute of thanks to your families and friends who have, through their contributions and support, helped to make this a very special day for all of us. Please turn and offer a round of applause to them. Congratulations. Congratulations to our families and supporters, but most of all, congratulations to our graduates. Your degrees weren't easy, and they are well earned. Now let's make this official and shout about it. Go Ducks! Shout a little bit softer now. 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 Shout a little bit softer now.